The Reformed Pastor, showing the nature of the pastoral work, especially in private instruction and catechism, with an open confession of our two open sins, prepared for a day of humiliation, kept at Wilchester, December 4th, 1655, by the ministers of that county who subscribed the agreement for catechism and personal instruction at their entrance upon that work, by their unworthy fellow servant, Richard Baxter, teacher of the church at Kildermunster, the second edition with appendix in answer to some objections, Luke 12:47, London, printed by Robert White for Nouvelle Simmons, bookseller at Kildermeister, and are to be sold by Joseph Nouvelle at the Plough in Paul's Churchyard, 1657. This is the first uh, year copy, second edition, being read by Peter John Parisis. This is not the abridged form. This is the entire thing. This copy was uploaded online from the Princeton Theological Seminary. To my reverend and dearly beloved brethren, the faithful ministers of Christ in Britain and Ireland, grace and peace in Jesus Christ be increased. Reverend brethren, the subject of this treatise, so nearly concerneth yourselves and the churches committed to your care, that it is persuaded and emboldened me to this address, notwithstanding the imperfections in the manner of handling it, and the consciousness of my great unworthiness to be your monitor. Before I come to my principal error, I shall give you the account which I suppose I owe you of the reasons of this following work and of the freedoms of speech which to some may be displeasing. The Prefix When the Lord had awakened his ministers in the county and some neighboring parts to a sense of their duty in the work of catechism and private instruction of all in their parishes that would not obstinately refuse their help and when they had subscribed an agreement containing their resolutions for the future performance of it, they had judged it unmeet to enter upon the work where, without a solemn humbling of their souls before the Lord for their so long neglect of so great and necessary a duty. And therefore they agreed to meet together at Wilchester, December 4th, 1655, and there to join in such humiliation and an earnest prayer to God for the pardon of their neglects and for his special assistance in the work that he, we had undertaken and for the success of it with the people whom we are engaged to instruct at which time, among others, I was desirous to them to preach, in answer to their desires to prepare the following discourse, which, though it proved longer than could be delivered in one or two sermons, yet I intended to have entered upon it at that time, and to have delivered that which was most pertinent to the occasion, and to have reserved the rest to another season. But before the meeting, by the increase of my ordinary pain and weakness, I was disabled from going thither. To recompense which unwilling omission, I easily yielded to the request of divers of the brethren, forthwith to publish the things which I had prepared, that they might see that which they could not hear, if now it be objected that I should not have spoken so plainly or sharply against the sins of the ministry or that I should not have published it to the view of the world, or at least that I should have done it in another tongue, and not in the ears of the vulgar, especially at such a time when Quakers and Papists are endeavoring to bring the ministry into contempt, and the people are too prone to hearken to their suggestions. I confess I thought the objection very considerable, but that it prevailed not to alter my resolutions, is to be ascribed to the following reasons. Number one, it was a purposed, solemn humiliation that we were agreed on, and that this was prepared and intended for. And how should we be humbled without a plain confession of our sin? 
Number two, it was principally our own sins that the confession did concern, and who can be offended with us for confessing our sin and taking the blame and shame to ourselves, which our consciences told us we ought to do. Number three, I have accepted in our confessions those that are not guilty and therefore hope I have injured none. Number four, having necessarily prepared it in the English tongue, I had no spare time to translate it. Number five, where the sin is open in the sight of the world, it is in vain to attempt to hide it. Number six, in such attempts will but aggravate it and increase our shame. Number seven, a free confession is a condition of a full remission, and when the sin is public, the confession must be public. If the ministers of England had sinned only in Latin, I would have made shift to have admonished them in Latin, or else have said nothing to them. But if they will sin in English, they must hear it in, of it in English. Unpardoned sin will never let us rest or prosper, though we be at never so much care and cost to cover it. Our sin will surely find us out, though we find not it. The work of confession is purposely to make known our sin, and freely to take the shame to ourselves. And if he that confesses and forsaketh be the man that shall have mercy, no wonder then if he that covereth it prosper not. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13. If we be so tender of ourselves and of loath to confess, God will be the less tender of us, and he will indict our confessions for us. He will either force our consciences to confess, or his judgment shall proclaim our iniquities to the world. Know we not how many malice adversaries are day and night at work against us? Some openly revile us, and some in secret are laying the designs, and contriving that which others execute, and are in ex expectation of a fuller stroke at us, which may subvert us at once. What is it but our sins that is the strength of all these enemies? Is not this evil from the ordering of the Lord? Till we are reconciled unto him, we are never safe. He will never want a rod to scourge us by. The tongues of Quakers and Papists and many other sorts are all at work to proclaim our sins, because we will not confess them ourselves, because we will not speak the truth, that they will speak much more than the truth. Yet if we had man only to plead our cause with, perhaps we might do much to make it good. But while God accuses us, how shall we be justified? And who shall hide our sins when he will have them brought to light? And God is our accuser till we accuse ourselves. But if we would judge ourselves, he would not judge us. 8. The fire is always kindled, which revealeth our sin. Judgment is begun at the house of God. Hath the minister suffered nothing in England, Scotland, and Ireland? And have there been no attempts for their overthrow? Hath it not been put to the vote in an assembly that some are called a Parliament of England, whether the whole frame of the established ministry and its legal maintenance should be taken down? And were we not put to plead our title to that maintenance as if we had been falling into the hands of the Turks that had thirsted for our subversion as resolved enemies of the Christian cause? And who knows not how many of these men are yet alive, and how high the same spirit yet is, and busily contriving the accomplishment of the same design? Shall we think that they have ceased their enterprise because they are working more subtly in the dark? 
What are the swarms of railers at the ministry sent abroad the land for, but to delude, excavate, and disaffect the people, and turn the hearts of the children from their fathers, that they may be ready to promote the main design? And is it not then our wisest course to see that God be our friend, and to do that which tendeth most to engage him in our defense. I think it is no time now to stand upon our credit so far as to neglect our duty and befriend our sins and so provoke the Lord against us. It rather be see, seems us to fall down at the feet of our offended Lord and to justify him in his judgments and freely impertinently to confess our transgressions and to resolve upon a speedy and thorough reformation before wrath break out upon us which will leave us no remedy it's time to make up all breaches between heaven and earth when we stand in such necessity of the divine protection for how can an impenitent, unreformed people expect to be sheltered by holiness itself. It is a stubborn child that under the rod will refuse to confess his faults, when it is not the least use of the rod to extort confession. We feel much, we fear much, and all for sin. And yet, are we so hardly drawn to a confession? Number nine. The world also knows that we are sinners as none can suppose us perfect, so our particular sins are too apparent to the world. And is it not meet, then, that they should see that we are penitent sinners? It is sure a greater credit to us to be penitent sinners than impenitent sinners, and one of the two shall be while we are on earth. Certainly, as Repentance is necessary to the recovery of our peace with God. So is it also to the reparation of our credit with wise and godly men. It is befriending and excusing our sin that is our shame indeed, and lendeth towards everlasting shame, which the shame of penitent confession would prevent. Number 10. Our penitent confession and speedy reformation are the means that must silence the reproaching adversaries. He is imprudently inhuman that will reproach men with their sins that bewail them and penitently charge them upon themselves. Such men have a promise of pardon from God, and shall men take us by the throat when God forgiveth us? Who dare condemn us when God shall justify us? Who shall lay that to our charge, which God hath declared that, that he will not charge us with? When sin is truly repented of by gospel indulgence, it ceases to be ours. What reader way then can we imagine to free us from the shame of it? than to shame ourselves for it in penitent confessions and to break off from it by speedy reformation. Number 11. The leaders of the flock m must be exemplary to the rest and therefore in this duty as well as in any other it is not our part only to teach them repentancy but to go before them in the exercise of it ourselves. As far as we excel them in knowledge and other gifts, so far should we also excel them in this and other graces. Number 12. To many that have set their hand to this sacred work, do so obstinately proceed in self-seeking, negligence, pride, division, and other sins that it is become our necessity duty to admonish them. If we could see that such would reform without reproof, we could gladly forbear the publishing of their faults. But when reproves themselves, 
do prove so ineffectual that they are more offended at the reproof than at the sin, but had rather that we should cease reproving than themselves should cease sinning. I think it is time to sharpen the remedy. For what else should we do? To give up our brethren as uncurable were cruelty as long as there are further means to be used. We must not hate them, but plainly rebuke them, and not suffer sin upon them. Leviticus 19.17 And to bear with the vices of the ministers is to promote the ruin of the church. For what speedier way is there for the depraving and undoing of the people than the depravity of their guides? And how can we more effectually further a reformation which we are so much obliged to do, than by endeavoring the reforming of the leaders of the church. Surely, brethren, if it be our duty to endeavor to cast out those ministers that are negligent, scandalous, and unfit for the work, and if we think this so necessary to the reformation of the church, as no doubt it is, it must needs be our duty to endeavor to heal the sins of others and to use a much gentler remedy to them that are guilty of a less degree of sin. If other men's sin deserve an ejection, sure ours deserve and require plain reproof. As for my part, I have done as I would be done by, and it is for God and for the safety of the church, and intended love to the brethren whom I do adventure, to re reprehend, not as others, to make them contemptible and odious, but to heal the evils that would make them so, that so no enemy may find this matter of reproach among us, but especially because our faithful endeavors are of so great necessity to the welfare of the church and the saving of men's souls, that it will not consist with a love to either, in a dominancy sort, to be negligent ourselves, or silently to contrive at and comply with the negligence. If thousands of you were at, in a leaking ship, and those that should pump out the water and stop the leaks should be sporting or asleep, yea, or but favor themselves in their labors to the hazarding of you all, would you not awake them to their work, and call out on them to labor as for your lives? And if you use some sharpness and opportunity with the slothful, would you think that man were well in his wits, that would take it ill of you, and accuse you of pride, self-conceitedness, or unmannerliness, or presume to talk? to salivate to your fellow workers, or should tell you that you wrong them by diminishing their reputation, would you not say, the work must be done, or we are all dead men in a ship ready to sink, and do you talk of reputation, or had you rather hazard yourself and us than hear of your slothfulness? This is our case, brethren. The work of God must needs be done. Souls must not perish while you mind your worldly business and observe the tithe and times and take your ease or quarrel with your brethren, nor must we be silent while men are hastening by you to perdition and the church to greater danger and confusion for fear of seeming too uncivil and unmannerly with you or displeasing your impatient souls. Would you be but an impatient with your sins as with reproofs? You should hear no more from us, but we should be all agreed. And neither God nor good men will let you alone in such sins. Yet if you had betaken yourselves to another calling, and would sin to yourselves only, and would perish alone, we should not have so much necessity of molesting you as now we have. But if you will enter into the office which is for the necessary pres preservation of us all, so that by letting you alone in your sin we must give up the church to apparent loss and hazard, 
blame us not if we talk to you more freely than you would have us do if your own body be sick and you will despise the remedy or if your own house be on fire and you will be singing or quarreling in the streets I can possibly bear it and let you alone which yet in charity I should not easily do but if you will undertake to be the physician of an hospital or to all the town which is infected with the plague or will undertake to quench all the fires that shall be kindled in the town there is no bearing with your reminis how much soever it may displease you take it how you will you must be told of it and if that will not serve you must be yet closerly told of it and if that will not serve if you be rejected as well as reprehended you must thank yourselves I speak all this to none but the guilty and thus I have given you those reasons which forced me even in plain English to publish so much of the sins of the ministry as in the following treatises I have done and I suppose the more penitent and humble any are and the more desirous of the truest reformation of the church the more easily and silly will they approve such free confessions and reprehensions